Welcome to the debate uh, on the rule of law in Europe, uh, co-organized by the CEU Democracy Institute uh, and the Review of Democracy, the online journal uh, of the Democracy Institute. Uh, the CEU Democracy Institute was uh, created last year uh, after the, all the teaching programs uh, of the Central European University were forced uh, uh, out uh, of Hungary. Uh, the Democracy Institute does uh, research on processes of uh, uh, redemocratization or the democratization. Uh, it uh, contributes uh, to new forms of uh, transnational teaching and it engages uh, the public in open and uh, open exchange of ideas uh, and public debates. Our debate today on the rule of law in Europe uh, is the second one in our series that started uh, last year in November uh, on uh, a debate uh, about uh, democracy in the United States. Uh, today we have two speakers, uh, uh, Didier Ray Knowles, uh, European Com Commissioner for Justice, uh, responsible among others uh, for preventing and uh, identifying breaches of the rule of law and enforcing uh, uh, EU rules uh, in this field. Uh, our second speaker is Katarin Che, Hungarian member uh, of uh, the European Parliament and vice president of Renew Europe. Uh, the moderator is Lauren Peck, a professor of European law uh, and head of law and politics department at Middlesex uh, University. The debate will last uh, around 45 uh, 50 minutes. Uh, it will be followed by QA. Uh, please send uh, your comments uh, or uh, questions uh, via the uh, Facebook, and they will be transferred uh, to the moderator. Uh, that's all. Uh, I give the floor uh, first uh, to the moderator, Lawrence. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction and uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be uh, in charge of moderating uh, the discussion between our two distinguished uh, speakers. So essentially, may I just remind our distinguished speakers that uh, uh, we have uh, given each of uh, them about eight minutes to present their views on the rule of law, so-called uh, rule of law regulation, which was uh, recently adopted by the Council and the Parliament on the basis uh, following some controversial, should we say, uh, conclusions adopted by the European Council. Once the presentations are over, I'm going to ask our two speakers some uh, broad and possibly technical questions, and then I'll collect uh, some questions from the audience, uh, and then uh, we'll relay the questions to our two distinguished uh, speakers. So now I would like to give the floor uh, first uh, to uh, Commissioner, Re Commissioner Reinders, uh, if you please. Well, thank you very much, Professor. And first of all, I want to thank you for this opportunity to discuss uh, about the, the, the new regulation that we have after many years of discussions at the uh, AU level. And thanks for such an invitation, uh, because it's very important to explain what it's possible to do uh, with the newly adopted rule of law uh, conditionality. And I'm particularly glad to discuss about the, the rule of law in an event organized by the Central European University, which is known for its commitment uh, to all fundamental values. And let me start by underlying that the rule of law, like democracy and fundamental rights, is one of the values on which on our union is founded. And as stated in Article 2 of the Treaty on the European Union. It's very important to repeat on the time, uh, on the, all the time that we are working on the basis of some values and uh, not on other kind of uh, elements. And the rule of law is of fundamental importance because it uh, guarantees the protection of all other values, including just democracy and, and respect for fundamental rights. Moreover, the rule of law plays a crucial role for the functioning of the uh, European Union. It's essential for mutual trust which enables effective judicial cooperation in civil and criminal matters between uh, uh, member states. But the rule of law is also uh, important for the effective functioning of our internal market and for the business and investment friendly environment. Uh, the rule of law is also essential for ensuring that budgets are spent in accordance with the applicable rules. And the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic as further highlighted the importance of the rule of law 
and has proven by, to be a real stress test for the resilience of our national systems. It has also underlined how the rule of law has a direct impact on people's daily lives. And we have tried to monitor all the measures taken during the emergency period uh, due to the pandemic. Unfortunately, respect for the rule of law cannot be taken for granted. We have seen the rule of law concerns emerging over the past years in certain member states. There's challenges related in particular to interferences with judicial independence, checks and balances, but also to the shrinking space for civil society, media pluralism and academic freedom. Let me stress that recent rule of law concerns have only made the European Commission more convinced of the importance of using all the instruments at its disposal to uphold the rule of law. Last year, you know that the Commission established uh, a new instrument, the European Rule of Law Mechanism, with the Rule of Law report at its heart. The mechanism is conceived uh, as a yearly process during which we aim to prevent problems for emerging or deepening. It will create collective awareness on the situation of the rule of law across the EU and keep this topic high on the political agenda. It will stimulate a permanent discussion on the rule of law year after year. The goal is to organize a real uh, um, culture of the rule of law in all the member states in discussion, not only with the government, but with the parliament, the opposition, and the civil society. And let me now come to the topic of today's discussion to help repair the economic and social damage caused by the coronavirus pandemic, the European Commission, the European Parliament and the EU leaders have agreed on a recovery plan that will lead uh, the way out of the crisis and lay the foundations <coughs> of, uh, for a modern and more sustainable Europe. The EU's long-term budget coupled with Next Generation EU, the temporary instrument designed to boost the recovery, will be the largest stimulus uh, package ever uh, and uh, it will be the first time that we finance uh, such a very large package through the EU budget. A total of 1.3 trillion will help rebuild, rebuild a post-COVID-19 Europe. It will be a greener, more digital and more, and more resilient Europe. <clears throat> the Council decision of 17 December, on 17 December was the final step in the adoption of the EU's next term budget. Following this decision, the multi-annual financial framework for 21-27 uh, of 1.074 trillion uh, in 2018 prices uh, becomes available for all beneficiaries of EU funding. At the same time, work towards finalizing next generation EU continues. As you know, part of this package includes a so-called rule of law conditionality, <clears throat> the regulation of a general regime of conditionality for the protection of the union budget. This is an important new instrument to protect the EU budget. The reasoning behind this regulation is simple. In order to control the use of EU funds and to protect the financial interests of the EU against corruption and fraud, we need independent justice systems, effective investigation and prosecution services, and an effective functioning of public authorities implementing the union budget. Thanks to the newly adopted regulation, the Commission may propose to the Council to adopt measures to address breaches of the rule of law principles that affect the financial interests of the union. The measures intend to protect the financial interests of the union and include, for instance, suspension and termination of payments as well as financial corrections. The regulation was adopted on 16 December 2020 and applies since 1st January 2021. As underlined by President Borderland before the European Parliament, any breach that occurs from that day onwards will be covered by the regulation. The Commission will assess alleged breaches in an objective, impartial and fair manner. Moreover, the interest of final beneficiaries will be protected. The goal is not to uh, have a problem with the final, all final beneficiaries, but also to protect them if it's possible through different ways, by uh, different ways to finance the final uh, 
beneficiaries. And the Commission will now proceed with adopting guidelines, and certainly about the protection of the final beneficiaries, which will set out how the Commission will implement the regulation. Let me conclude my intervention here, but I, I look forward to your question. I want just to add one element. Uh, in fact, we have two ways now, two new ways to protect the AU budget. I have insisted on the regulation on the conditionality is one way to prote protect AU budget against some possible breach to the rule of law. But in the first semester, we'll start to sort the operations of the Open Public Prosecutor Office. And for the first time, it will be possible to organize investigations and maybe also prosecutions from the open level about some fraud, some abuse, some uh, other crimes against the AU budget. And you know that with the Chief Prosecutor, Laura Covizzi, we are in the last phase of the installation. We have now the College of Prosecutors, we are in the phase for the, the appointment of all the delegate prosecutors, and I'm hoping that it will be in this first semester for 2021 to start. So we'll start the conditionality on one side, but also the working and the operations of the Open Public Prosecutor Office on the other side. So we have now different tools to uh, protect the EU budget. But of course, we have, so I said, different other tools to protect the rule of law, like the annual report on the rule of law, the infringement proceedings, the Article 7 portion. So I'll be open to answer to your questions on all those different uh, subjects. Thanks for this opportunity to, to explain to you what the situation now is. Thank you very much, Commissioner. A perfect uh, timekeeping, very instructive presentation. Thank you very much again. Um, I'm going to give the floor to our uh, MEP from Hungary and also Vice President of uh, Renew Europe. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lauren, and uh, many thanks to the CEU Democratic Institute for hosting this debate and inviting me. Let me just spell out that it's highly symbolic that we are talking about the rule of law uh, as organized by the CEU, which is, in my opinion, is a European-wide symbol of democratic gaslighting. I could never in my life imagine that in the 21st century, in the middle of the European Union, we could witness an independent university being pushed out of the country, of my country. I, I think it's a tragic symbol. And uh, this is a permanent reminder as well that why do we have to keep fighting for rule of law? Now, democratic backsliding sounds maybe a bit of a technical word for those who witness uh, these proceedings from the outside. But let me tell you that for us Hungarians, it meant that in the framework, uh, in the course of 10 years, the current government has uh, effectively dismantled independent institutions, uh, rolled back media freedom. And uh, we are in a situation right now that we classify as the first uh, country inside the EU, which is not no longer a democracy according to Freedom House. If we would apply to the EU right now, I have a strong suspicion that we would not get accepted. And in the same time, those cronies, oligarchs and family members of the government who are maintaining this uh, current system, they still receive millions and billions of euros from the, the European taxpayers uh, money that was meant to help the entirety of our country. And I'm a passionate European. I truly believe that Europe is the best thing that could have ever happened to, to Hungary. But yet I still have a hard time explaining it to our voters in the countryside, all over the country, who feel the effects of democratic backsliding on their skin and who witness this uh, misuse of funds day by day at why is the EU not doing anything against that. And let me just clarify one thing. I don't want the European Union to interfere in our elections. I don't want the European Union to change our government. This is our job. But what I really want to see from the Commission, uh, and I hope that with the help of the new conditionality mechanism is, is to step up against those who misuse European funds, to step up against those who uh, do not comply with uh, the requirements set down in Article 2, and to use the tools available to their fullest extent. Now, last year was the year for a successful fight uh, for the rule of law. And I'm very happy to see that finally we have a financial instrument that uh, is aimed to safeguard uh, taxpayers' money and to crack down on corruption. The question is, 
will it be utilized or not? The EU always had a deep variety of, of instruments, infringement procedures, for instance, uh, or uh, there was also a possibility to freeze uh, money for LGBTQ free towns in Poland. This instrument existed for many, many years back. And, and yet I always feel that there was uh, quite a bit of a timidness in uh, the way these mechanisms were utilized. Uh, I think the CEU case is a very good example. The court ruling on the CEU arrived last year when the CEU already have taken up their headquarters in Vienna. So, so the question is, uh, if the, the existence of these mechanisms could be justified uh, or, or, or these only exist on paper, are they, is it possible to utilize them better to, to save our European values? And let me just stress that this is not only a Hungarian problem or not only a Polish problem per se. Uh, this is a pr problem of systematic democratic backsliding that's happening within the European Union under the watch of the Council and Commission. If we just take a long hard look at Bulgaria or Slovenia, for instance, I uh, think we will always find concerning problems there as well. So I truly believe that the integrity of the European Union depends on the fact or depends on the solution, what we can provide to fight against those who want to dismantle our union from within. The Trojan horses that fight against our values within our framework and while they still receive funds to finance their own corrupted means. We also, also see that this drives Euroscepticism all over the continent. And uh, I, I, I very often receive emails from taxpayers from Denmark, from Finland, who pay high taxes. And a part of these high taxes come, go to the European budget. And, and they very often ask me that they read about the corruption happening in Hungary in their own papers. And they ask themselves the question that why do they still keep on financing that? And uh, in my opinion, opinion, this very, very deeply contributes to the rise of Euroscepticism all over Europe. And I find it very interesting, so to say, that those far right parties, uh, also in other parts of Europe, who, in one hand, fight for a stricter uh, case of anti-corruption, they are also the, those who cheer for the actions of the Orban government, uh, whose actions exactly contribute to what has happened in, in Europe and uh, the, the processes that have been spreading all over the continent. So uh, let me just cite one very concrete case, and I'm looking forward to continuing the discussion uh, based on the questions of the moderator. But a few weeks ago, there was a notice that the son-in-law of Mr. Viktor Orban, who was, by the way, uh, previously caught in a fraudulent uh, mm, fraudulent handling of European taxpayers' money, now receives 600,000 euros for his agribusiness. Now, we have a mechanism called EDES, uh, basically a European blacklist, to handle those companies which are under prosecution for corruption or those individuals who have corrupted such crimes before. Why is this instrument not, instrument not used better? Why cannot we create a European white blacklist to cancel out those individuals uh, from receiving our money who are known to misuse it? Uh, what is the Commission intends to do about such cases? I, I am very, very curious to hear uh, Commissioner Reinders' comments. I know that you are a fighter for rule of law and I very much enjoy the cooperation uh, with you. Uh, I, I think the Parliament will be on the side, uh, on the good side of, of this fight. I think the rule of law conditionality mechanism was also a result of a good cooperation between Parliament and the uh, Commission. I was one of the negotiators and I, I think we managed to improve this, uh, this regulation very much so, but now is the time for actions and the Parliament is ready to act. Is the Commission ready to act? So this is my question going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in fact, uh, you're making my job quite uh, easy because you just finished with a question, which in fact, I'm just going to relay to Commissioner Reinders. So is the Commission ready to act? And possibly can Commissioner Reinders uh, rebound on the issue of a possible blacklisting of uh, recipients of EU funding, meaning that uh, when someone has been found 
uh, guilty of misuse of EU funds, is it still possible to get more EU funding even after being found guilty of misuse of EU funds? So possibly, Commissioner Reinders, can you uh, answer these two uh, rather difficult questions, possibly? So first of all, thanks for, for the support about uh, the way to uphold uh, uh, the, the rule of law, because uh, I've seen that uh, in the Parliament and I've seen also from the civil society. And to answer to your question, of course, the Commission is ready to act. And to act, we need to have some instruments. And of course, it's possible to act before the Court of Justice with the uh, infringement proceedings. But uh, to, to receive the possibility to use new instruments, it was sometimes very long before to reach an agreement uh, between the, the co-legislators and between the different actors. I remember that I have started the discussions uh, in another capacity in the Geneva Council in the beginning of 2016 about a possible uh, uh, peer review on the rule of law and a possible discussion on a report on the rule of law. And you have seen that I have had just in another capacity now as Commissioner for Justice to come with the, the first annual report on the rule of law in 2020. Uh, the same for the conditionality. You, you know that it was a proposal of the Commission from 2018. And uh, we uh, have seen that it was quite uh, long, during uh, more than two or three years, before to, to receive a final um, agreement of the co-legislators on this. And maybe uh, because there is a link with uh, some fraud and abuses, maybe due to the fact that when it was possible to create the PPO, I have referred to the PPO at the end of my introductory remarks, uh, it was possible to move with the Open Public Prosecutor Office, but on a voluntary uh, basis. It's an optional system. And you know that we have 22 uh, participants in the EPPO. Uh, classical opting out from Ireland, Sweden, and Denmark, maybe. But again, we have Poland and Hungary out of the scope. So of course, we will uh, have some arrangement to uh, work and to organize a, a correct uh, uh, cooperation between the EPPO and uh, uh, the national uh, justice systems also in Hungary and in Poland. But of course, if we don't have the capacity to start prosecutions and uh, investigation first and then prosecution from the EU level, we need something else. And it was maybe the beginning of the idea to go to the conditionality and to, to discuss some of the conditionality between the rule of law and the, uh, uh, the, the budget. And so on the basis of the treaties of the article uh, 322, uh, it's a specific instrument about the protection of the budget. And so, of course, the, the Commission is ready to use these instruments. Uh, we have waited some years before to have an agreement, I said, on the regulation. The regulation is intact. Uh, after the discussion in the Parliament, we didn't see any change at the Council level. I know that uh, there are many discussions about the conclusion of the Council. But so it's possible for the Commission to use the uh, regulation from the 1st of January. So it will be possible to organize a, a procedure about all the possible breach from the 1st of January in relation with all the different budgetary instruments used from the 1st of January, so the MFF and the next generation EU. And we are ready to do that on the basis of different instruments. So you know that we have uh, different elements in our rule of law report, but there are many other possible sources uh, to, to work on, on it. About the blacklist, of course, first of all, you know that it's possible for the national justice systems to uh, decide uh, to uh, form it different, uh, in different ways uh, to different recipients to receive, to receive again some funds from the public authorities after a condemnation. But I'm not uh, in charge of such a kind of uh, uh, element, but I want to say that I'm very uh, open to see how it's possible to use such a kind of mechanism. Of course, if you have uh, condemnations of different people in the corruption case of abuse and fraud, it's logical that you take into account the condemnation uh, when you discuss about new uh, funding. And so it must be maybe uh, possible for Olaf and maybe in the 22 member states for DPPO to take initiatives on that. But uh, I will uh, again discuss maybe with my colleague in charge for the budget to, to see what is possible to, to apply on the basis of such a, a kind of blacklist. But it's logical that if you have a condemnation for such a kind of crimes, like corruption cases, that you have an indication about the, the way to uh, limit the funding uh, later. But again, uh, the, the use of the new regulation, it's possible for the 1st of January. It's the regulation. So we have seen many comments about criticism uh, 
and the possible blockage at the council level from two member states, but the regulations is uh, in touch. So we have the same regulation that we have discussed with the parliament, so it will be possible to start. The only one uh, difference with the real uh, first proposal of the commission is the majority, but you know that to come from the unanimity to the qualified majority is a huge step. Of course, I have said also to the parliament, and my preference was to have a reverse qualified majority, like we have in other fields about the uh, European semester and the recommendation in relation with the European semester. But at the end, for the co-legislator, it was possible to move till the qualified majority, no more. We will see in the future. Maybe in the future, it will be possible to, to go further. But again, it's possible to use from the 1st of January. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm going to have a question for the two of you, but starting with Kathleen about the rule of law regulation, a more kind of a broader political question. Um, can we expect uh, the rule of law regulation to be a game changer? It has been described by some uh, key actors as a game changer when it comes to democratic and rule of law backsliding. I'd be interested in hearing uh, your views. So can he uh, change the, the, the process of democratic backsliding you have described, Kathleen? Or possibly on the contrary, are we going to end up, as he has been said also by some experts, uh, that we're going to end up possibly with another Article 7 uh, process, which is not going to lead anywhere. So Kathleen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, I think this is the question uh, that will be answered uh, in the coming months and years. If it is only another piece of paper, another piece of legal text that scholars can study and people can write dissertations about, then no, it won't change anything. And this is why I focus my first intervention on the need for the commission to act, for the need for the uh, political willpower to change things. Because if the council, and, and let's just face it, the council is the key here, is the council continues to do business as usual, uh, just doing their backroom deals and uh, keeping quiet about the, the frauds, the corruption, the democratic backsliding that's happening within the continent, and all hoping that this appeasement process uh, that's been going on for months will finally lead us somewhere, then, then I think we put the integrity of the European Union in peril. I cannot imagine that after what has happened at the end of last year, when the entire European recovery was put in danger by uh, two leaders representing countries heavily in the process of democratic backsliding, uh, after the veto of the Polish and Hungarian government or veto threat, uh, there is still somebody in the council who believes that appeasement with wannabe autocrats is, is a strategy that's working. If we do not take action now, then, uh, then we are in grave danger. Uh, I, I, I can talk about it for, for very long, but I think I made this point quite clear. Uh, not only me, the entire European Parliament, uh, we accepted numerous resolutions. We called on the Council to act on the uh, Commission to use its tools better, but uh, sometimes we just end up in a situation which is a deadlock. Uh, which, uh, for instance, also refers to some of the comments about the EPPO by uh, Com Commissioner Reinders. I deeply applaud uh, the installation of the EPPO. It's a, it's a great instrument, and we need it very much in the Union. However, specifically, those two countries decided not to join where maybe the biggest need would be uh, for, for a well-functioning European-level prosecution. So I, I'm wondering, whether uh, is this something that we accept in the EU or maybe we think about ways uh, where we could control the flow of European taxpayers' money better. Uh, for instance, we have OLAF and I, I heard the commissioner touching upon that briefly, but uh, maybe there could be a possibility that OLAF receives uh, more funding or more personnel which could concentrate specifically on those countries which are not under the jurisdiction, jurisdiction of the EPPO. Because of course we can wait for the Hungarian high prosecutor who is a former member of Fidesz to condemn the son-in-law of Mr. Orban or to cancel him out of uh, applying for funds. But I, I don't know, I have this slight suspicion that it would not lead uh, us too far. Um, also about, uh, certain dynamics between council and commission, I, I find it deeply frustrating and also very challenging for, for the future of the EU. 
Uh, and I would be very grateful if the uh, commissioner could share his views on the fact that basically in the council declaration, the council instructed the commission to do something, to wait. And I'm not a legal scholar, uh, Mr. Peck is, but in my understanding, uh, based on the treaties, it is not in the powers of the council to instruct the commission. Uh, and I still have a hard time explaining it to myself. How did it happen? Apart from the fact that uh, certain council members wanted to struck a deal and they wanted uh, to keep on with the appeasement of uh, Mr. Orban and, uh, and the peace party in, in, in Poland, like what else could be the explanation and how is that even feasible legally? So to conclude, I think we have the instruments to change the game. If we will use it, that's a question. But I truly believe that eventually the game changers will be the voters in these countries. And we have an election in, in 22 in Hungary. And ultimately, uh, with all high regards to the European Council and Commission, I think the Hungarian voters will change this game who finally see the outrageous corruption and uh, the lack of action of this government also in the wake of the pandemic. Uh, we need a new government and the voters will decide, but uh, the job of the European institutions is to do whatever they can in their means to ensure the rule of law and the fair handling of taxpayers' money in every single member state. Not only in Hungary, not only in Poland, but everywhere. Because otherwise other, Mr. Or uh, other mini Orbans can, can pop up who knows where. Do we need that? No. Mini Trumps or mini Orbans, yes. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Reinders, uh, uh, I'm just going to repeat the question I initially asked uh, Kathleen to answer. So is the rule of law regulation, uh, can we expect it to be a game changer? And if you wish, you can also address some of the points regarding OLAF and EPPO, whether, for instance, they need more resources at this stage and what to do uh, when the national prosecution services are actually captured by the national government. Then what can the EU do in this context? when prosecutions go nowhere. Uh, so some uh, difficult questions again uh, to you, Commissioner Reinders. So first of all, it's true that it's possible uh, to have a real game changer with the new regulations because uh, you know that the, the financial uh, pressure, it's an important one. Uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, be uh, in a previous life and use of finance in my home country in 12 years, so I know that uh, when you discuss about the budget, when you discuss about the funding coming from the EU level, it's become to be very important. And you have seen that uh, in the discussion also uh, in the Council, the European Council, because it was possible to, to see a veto uh, expressed during some weeks and maybe months before the end of the year. But at the end, again, we have the same regulation then discussed with the Parliament. Without any change, if you look to the text of the regulation, we don't have any change after the discussions in the in the council. So it's very important to repeat that. So that's the first element because uh, it's due to the fact that it was a real budgetary discussion that it was possible to uh, have uh, such a move from, in fact, two member states explaining that they have uh, real concern about the, the regulation, but at the end, uh, taking part in the adoption of the regulation. And the second element, maybe to be very concrete, it's the same regulation that we have discussed with the Parliament. So it's a game changer from the 1st of January. I repeat, the regulation will apply uh, from the 1st of January 2021 uh, onwards. And any breach that occurs from that day um, will be covered. And I can assure you, the Commission will always act in full autonomy and full respect of the law and full objectivity. So. We will start the necessary work, and we have started the necessary work of monitoring immediately since the beginning of this year. And when concerns arise, discussions with member states, we also uh, comments result undue delay. So it's starting from the 1st of January. The second element, it's true that uh, uh, one of the possible uh, breaches of the rule of law in relation with the budget, it's concern the uh, independence of the justice system and the possibility to organize real investigations and prosecution. Of course, I'm hoping that in the future it will be possible to convince uh, other governments, maybe not only in Hungary and in Poland, but in all the member states to take part in EPPO. But again, to start EPPO, it was needed to have an optional system, and we have 22 member states. But it will be also 
a possibility to push pressure uh, in the general debate due to the different pros prosecutions and investigations organized by the EPPO. It will be a climate in the European Union to work more, maybe effectively, on uh, corruption cases and on different kinds of abuse and fraud. And su 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 uh, such a kind of uh, action will have an influence on the taxpayers, asking for more and more uh, action in such a kind of, uh, of um, uh, domain. And of course, at the end, maybe with some consequences in Hungary and in, in Poland. But I want also to say that at the, the time they are also very uh, uh, concerning about the, uh, the situation of the rule of law. You have followed the situation in the, uh, in the US in the last uh, weeks and months, and there are many discussions about the rule of law. And uh, the new president, the elected now, the new president, Joe Biden, have uh, decided to organize maybe a discussion on democracy at the worldwide level and to organize an event on this. But to take part in such a process, we need to show that we are doing the job at home. And it's the reason why we have the report, it's the reason why now we are working with the transitional team. And again, I'm sure that it will be a real uh, game changer due to the fact that uh, the discussions about the budget are maybe the most important to have an influence in the different member states. And uh, we, we are starting since the beginning of this year with the process of uh, the uh, scrutiny about the, the situation in all the member states. And I'm hoping that uh, uh, also the pressure coming out is true from the European Parliament and from the civil society will have an influence. But at the end, and so to, to conclude with the same comment than uh, Kathleen, it's not just uh, maybe um, the, the question of the election, it's maybe to the citizens to change or not the situation in one or other member state. But it's also our job to discuss more and more with the civil society in the different member states. Because again, the goal is not just to discuss in Brussels uh, between the different uh, um, in European institutions about the rule of law, is to discuss in all the member states. And it's the reason why, on the basis of the report on the rule of law, I start a real tour of the uh, national parliament to discuss with the majority, but also with the opposition about the rule of law in the country. And I'm very open to do the same with the civil society in the different member states. Because again, without a real change in all the member states, it will be difficult. And my last comment is to say that when we are looking to the report on the rule of law and maybe with to other instruments, the most important element is that we have concerns about the rule of law in all the member states. But in a very large majority, there is a real intention to, to improve the situation and to change with some reform the situation in the country. In some, we have a more systemic problem. And uh, to be concrete, when we discuss with Poland, we don't speak all the time about the same uh, member state, but when we discuss with Poland about the independence of the judiciary, we have a real difficulty because we have seen in different occasions that it was needed to go to the court and will continue to go to the court of justice against different decisions in Poland. So it's more a systemic issue. We are in discussion about the independence of the justice system since some years in such a kind of country. And that's the real difference. So I'm hoping that the conditionality will have a huge influence uh, to, to try to push pressure on the authorities, but maybe on the different societies to, to change the, the way to discuss and to install the rule of law in all the, the different member states. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, since you mentioned uh, Commissioner Reinders' uh, compliance with the uh, rulings of the Court of Justice, so that's going to be my next uh, question. Essentially, uh, two questions into one, if you don't mind, uh, and we, uh, I'll give the floor to Kathleen to answer uh, this question, or one of the two questions. So essentially, my first question is, can we expect uh, the rule of law regulation to help the Commission address non-compliance with judgments of the Court of Justice, or should it be done on the basis of other mechanisms? I'm thinking here, in the case of Hungary, uh, uh, with non-compliance with the Lex NGO judgment of the Court of Justice uh, issued in June uh, last year. And essentially, uh, my question to Kathleen perhaps would be more of a political question. I mean, unless you want to answer this rather technical question. Uh, in your view, does the Commission do enough uh, when it comes to uh, examples of non-compliance with judgments uh, of the Court of Justice by Hungarian authorities? I'm thinking about the judgment, therefore, regarding the foreign-funded NGOs of last year, the judgment regarding the Central European University uh, also last year, and more recently, uh, the judgment of the Court of Justice regarding uh, uh, 
uh, immigration and asylum uh, law. So essentially, my question, it's a, two questions into one. Can we expect the rule of law regulation to be helpful when it comes to compliance with ECGA rulings? And if not, uh, what can we do essentially to increase compliance and sanction national governments which do not comply promptly with judgments of the Court of Justice? So of Kathleen, course we are paying. We are perhaps paying Commissioner, Commissioner Rangers, yeah. I'm gonna give the floor to Kathleen and then uh, back to you. Okay, fine. <laughs> Thank you. Kathleen? Well, I would have preferred uh, hearing also the Commissioner's answer okay. because of course I do expect. Uh, but uh, I have questions. So I am waiting for a reassuring uh, answer first from the commissioner and then I may add some political comments later. Because what we see now that there are some rulings and they are never complied with, not even after years. And uh, I mean, it raises questions about the credibility of these instruments or, uh, or the weight of these rulings if a country can just uh, put it aside and, and not to do anything with it. I'm not sure whether the uh, rule of law conditionality is the instrument which takes care of, uh, of these kind of problems. Uh, it necessarily, or like regards cases around the budgetary compliance, but of course it also includes independence of judiciary. So there might be some sort of a overlap, but I, do believe that we might need other instruments to address questions like this because it has to be addressed. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Commissioner Reinders, back to you with uh, more technical questions uh, regarding this time. Uh, I'd like uh, essentially the focus to be on compliance with judgments of the Court of Justice and whether essentially the rule of law regulation can help or can the Commission uh, act on other basis? Well, f first of all, of course, we are paying attention to the uh, real uh, compliance with the, the different rulings. In many different cases, you know that there are many infringement proceedings, there are many rulings from the court. I know that you are focused on some, but we are working with all the member states about the necessity to uh, uh, be in full compliance with the rulings of the uh, Court of Justice. And about the NGOs and about the education law, higher education law in, in Hungary, uh, we are in discussion for the moment with the Hungarian government. So we have uh, sent letters, we have received responses, and we are analyzing now the situation. So we continue to do that, like we are doing for with all the different member states. Uh, to be very concrete about uh, uh, the Hungarian higher education law, it's a ruling from uh, October last year. So I know that I've said that in some other discussions, we don't have exactly the same timing than Twitter in the Commission. So uh, it's possible to react the day after and to ask to be in line with the ruling in some weeks, but you know that in all the member states that takes some time before to come with a new regulation. So first of all, we discuss with the member states, so we ask if there is a real willingness to change the, the provisions to be in full compliance with the ruling, and then we verify if it's the case. So of course, if it's not, we are very open to use all the different tools at our disposal to, to react. And um, of course, it's possible to use maybe in the near future now the new regulation on the uh, conditionality, if of course there is a link between the non-compliance to some rulings uh, of the Court of Justice and the budgetary situation, because you know that uh, the new conditionality is about the EU budget, so it's impossible to say uh, we have non-compliance with some uh, rulings uh, concerning uh, fundamental rights, to be very concrete, without any link with the budget, and then to use the conditionality. But it will be of course possible to use the conditionality mechanism if we have a, a real uh, a possibility to, to show that uh, the uh, link between the non-compliance with some rulings of the ECG uh, and uh, the budgetary uh, situation. For the other instruments, of course, in some cases, it's very important to go back maybe to the court and to try to receive some other financial uh, sanctions to the, the different member states. You know that we have uh, organized some uh, uh, preliminary uh, proceedings about that. If you remember about the situation of some uh, judges in Poland, it was possible to go to the court and to ask also some uh, uh, decisions to, to show that uh, it's needed for the different member states to comply with the ruling. So no, we are in discussion now on the two uh, specific rulings that you have mentioned with Hungary. We are at the end of the process for the NGOs because we have sent a letter with these answers and now we will see if there is a real intention to change the regulation or not. If it's not, uh, 
we will continue to move and maybe to act. Thank you very much. Uh, Kathleen, you want to rebound? If I'm, yes, Please. very, very briefly, if I may come back. Uh, so I was just thinking about uh, the rule of law report while the commissioner was speaking. And I, I, I mean, I find it a very, very interesting tool and I greatly enjoyed reading that. Uh, however, I do miss a part from this report, which might also serve as a remedy to the question that was raised and which is basically timelines for correction and uh, possible sanctions if these corrections were not made. And there was an excellent report by my colleague Michal Szymeczka uh, that was voted on the European Parliament with a very big majority, which uh, specifically includes provisions that uh, might further complement the rule of law reporting to make it also maybe a bit more practical. So I'm hoping to see the Commission taking up some of these considerations and uh, complement the report with uh, these kind of mechanisms that was proposed by my colleague Szymeczka. Commissioner Reinders, you want to reply to this specific point? No, I said we, we tried to continue to, to see if there's a real uh, intention first in the different member states to, to be in full compliance with the Brazil of the Court. And then, of course, we need to verify if uh, this the kind of intention is putting in a new uh, draft law or in some other provisions uh, to be sure that it's a reality. And of course, that takes some time. And I must say that uh, it's true that in different situations that we have seen uh, again in the last uh, months, uh, it seems to be long between the decision of the court and then uh, the real action uh, to push pressure on one member state. But it's also the rule of law. I know that that takes some time to to have a decision in the Court of Justice. We have seen that. Eh? If I'm looking to the Hungarian higher education law uh, concerning some universities, uh, it was a, uh, uh, a decision in the end of 2017 to act. Three years later, we received the decision of the Court. But it's after a real debate and a real possibility, of course, for the Hungarian government to explain the situation and to uh, defend its position before the Court. So, I know that the process in justice and the process between the Commission and the Member States seems all the time to be long in comparison with the situation on the ground. I fully understand. And it's the reason why I said when it's needed, we are going to where there, were, where, where there are some individuals in question. Uh, we are going to the court to ask for interim measures and to try to push more pressure on uh, one government. But if you want to have a full respect for the rule of law, it's impossible just to condemn uh, a government by a tree. Uh, we don't agree about the way for a former president of the US uh, to manage the foreign policy by trees. It's impossible to uh, take decision at the commission level, like in the Court of Justice, just by tree. And so we tried to do that with a procedure. And again, uh, it's true that to be in full compliance, that uh, requests some changes in the member states. And we push pressure to be sure that it's possible to do that. If it's not, of course, we need to continue to use other tools. And we need maybe to discuss with the department about uh, the ways to improve our possibilities to uh, push pressure on the member states about the full compliance with the rulings of the Court of Justice. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Since we are hosted by the CEU, let me just point out in the, that in the CEU infringement action, the Commission failed to ask for interim measures. So the, the Commission had discretion to ask for interim measures. No interim measures were asked, and therefore, essentially, damage was done irreparably. But that's just a comment from the moderator abusing his role as a moderator. In fact, no, I have. I tried, a... I tried to do my, my best since uh, December 19th. Yes, uh, I understand. It was previous. Your time. It was uh, before your time. Um, actually, I have not another CE-related uh, uh, question, but this time based on the fact that we are hosted by the CE Democracy Institute, and we're talking about the rule of law regulation. But can we expect or can we hope the rule of law regulation to actually play or have an impact on the process of democratic backsliding? Uh, Kathleen highlighted uh, during our presentation. Uh, Kathleen pointed out rightly that according to democracy experts, Hungary can no longer be considered a democracy. In fact, it was uh, classified as the EU's first authoritarian regime by the VDEM experts, so the most uh, reputable uh, network of democracy experts in the world. So my question to you both is, uh, 
So the rule of law regulation, as the name does indicate, is mostly about the rule of law violations, but can we expect at least a knock-on impact on some uh, aspects relating to democracy, democratic backsliding? So I don't know who would like to be the first one to reply um, uh, to this question. Uh, Commissioner Reinders, back to you. It's possible, yes. No, f first of all, I fully understand that there are many uh, comments and many reactions about the situation in different member states. It's not by coincidence that we have two Article 7 uh, procedures on the table of the Council. One uh, started by the Commission about Poland and one started by the Parliament about Hungary. So, of course, I'm not surprised that uh, there are some concerns expressed by other groups and some experts. But you know that with the Article 7 procedure, it was possible to organize hearings, to organize some state of place. I took part in many uh, meetings on this in different capacities, but also as commissioner. And thanks to the Portuguese presidency, we'll continue to do that. Uh, there is a real commitment from the Prime Minister of Portugal to continue to work on the base of Article 7. But uh, we are in the limits of the treaties. And of course, in the limits of the treaties, you know the majority uh, uh, rules uh, about the Article 7. And if you need to go to uh, a very high level of qualified majority and sometimes to unanimity, it's become to be difficult to take a decision. Is the reason why to try to address the different remarks about the rule of law in the, in the different member states, we try to have a real toolbox with different kinds of instruments. I must say that it's enough in many member states to organize a dialogue with the member states and to see if it's possible to discuss about reforms to improve the situation. In some member states, it's useful to have a very specific mechanism, just to mention the CVM that we have with uh, Romania and Bulgaria due to the transition uh, with the, after the accession to the, uh, the European Union. But then it's very important for the Commission to try to use all the different uh, instruments that we have in the toolbox and to go, I said, to the Court of Justice to uh, discuss on the basis of the rule of law report and now to use the conditionality. And of course, uh, we'll have a, a moment of discussion when it will be possible for the Commission to show a real problem uh, between the rule of law and the budgetary situation in the near future, uh, when we, have, we will have such a kind of discussion, it will be a moment of uh, uh, real uh, trust at the uh, different level in the different institutions, certainly the Council, to see if it's possible to have a qualified majority to confirm that. And so that's the real evolution that we have with the new uh, regulation. It will be possible all to push pressure and maybe to have a positive evolution in different member states, because I might preference it to don't use, of course, these instruments. But if it's needed to go to a final uh, proposal of the Commission about one member state, it will be in the head of the Council to agree or not with the two thirds uh, qualified, I mean, the qualified majority, not the two thirds, the qualified majority, sorry, uh, at the Council level. And, and that's the real discussion. But again, I fully understand that there are some remarks coming from different group of experts as well, because again, it's not by coincidence that we have the two seven, Article 7 procedure for the moment. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Kathleen, would you like to step in? Or, otherwise, I have plenty of uh, questions coming from the audience, but we have only five minutes left, so uh, yeah. I'll have to okay, pick so and choose briefly. one or two. Please. Um, so let me start by saying that the Parliament wanted to have a broader scope uh, for the rule of law conditionality. We were fighting for that. Unfortunately, the Council did not share our views uh, with this regard, which I'm deeply sorry for. Um, how, and, and I heard a lot of comments from Hungarian civil society and from other actors as well, that it, it is very limited, that it only the current regulation only focuses on issues related to the budget, and it's not enough. However, I still do believe that it's a very, very, very important step in the fight against democratic backsliding. Because I need to stress it every single time when I address an audience that democratic backsliding and corruption are two sides of the same coin. Uh, every authoritarian regime, every uh, government on the way of becoming one, is su uh, sustained by a network of corrupted oligarchs and cronies of the network of people uh, who are being paid off from uh, illicit financing uh, or financing administered in an illicit way. And unfortunately, in the case of European countries, 
these uh, funds very often come from European uh, taxpayers' pockets. These are those subsidies that were meant to belong to the poor people on the countryside, to the suffering small businesses, and in return, they end up in the pockets of cronies who sometimes purchase some media on behalf of uh, the government or uh, to push out uh, other businesses uh, from competition who might uh, appear to be in the way for uh, someone in power. So if we can cut this tie between the network of cronies and the European uh, subsidies, that is a very, very big step forward. And it's particularly important in the current framework when a never before seen amount of money is being administered by the EU, uh, the stimulus package that was meant to help uh, the, the recovery after the COVID crisis. It's essential, it's deeply essential also for the countries, but also for the European Union as a whole to make these funds to be administered properly, to end up in the right places, and for everybody who misuses this money uh, to be prosecuted. And this is why I think this is the toolbox. The conditionality mechanism is one part of it, but there are other parts. For instance, a European blacklist that I am stressing once more in this discussion, we need to have it. I know, Commissioner, this is not on your table. I will also uh, ask Commissioner Hahn uh, about that, but I think it's deeply essential to heavily prosecute anybody who misuses the funds that were supposed to serve the recovery. And this Thank also uh, contributes to the fight against the marketing backsliding. Thank obviously. you very much. Uh, if our two speakers have five more minutes, I can ask you some, some short practical questions I have received from uh, the audience. Uh, most of the questions I have received uh, are actually directed at Commissioner Reinders. So let me begin with you. So I've received a number of practical questions. Let me ask them uh, to you. Is the Commission already working on the so-called guidelines, uh, which were called uh, by the European Council? Uh, and uh, the, another question is, when uh, is the Commission already gathering evidence in order to apply the new mechanism? So a question on guidelines, are they being drafted? Uh, evidence, is it being gathered? So my, these are the two practical questions I have received from members of the audience for you, Commissioner. Right, it's possible to be very brief. Yes, of course we are working on the guidance or the working methods of the Commission to see how it's possible to prepare such a, a way forward. And on, e, uh, on evidence, of course, we are working on it since the beginning of this year. I said it was a sort of comment of the President of the Commission before the Parliament. But uh, we have started before because, uh, again, I, I have uh, explained the situation with the new uh, uh, instrument that we have with the annual report on the rule of law. And of course, with the description of the situation in relation with uh, justice systems, corruption, media pluralism, and checks and balances in the annual report. We have a lot of uh, elements. I mean, just to uh, say that, of course, we are working on, on the working methods, the, the, the guidance, but we continue to monitor the situation. And we have started uh, the work on the second report on the rule of law that we will publish, uh, publish in, in July. So it's uh, for the moment it's also our, our work to, to prepare the second report on the rule of law for, for July. Thank you very much. Last question for Kathleen. I had received a question about uh, the EP resolution of December following the conclusions of the European Council. In this resolution, the European Parliament essentially, let me put it informally, uh, threatened the Commission with uh, a failure to act action should the new uh, rule of law regulation not be used by the Commission. So possibly a difficult question, Kathleen, but uh, personally, uh, what kind of timeline do you have in mind before you would consider uh, a failure to act uh, action against the Commission? So 12 months, how much time can you give the Commission to develop those guidelines and then start applying this new rule of law uh, regulation? Well, I think the Commission has given itself a guideline uh, in front of the Parliament uh, December plenary session. Ursula von der Leyen stated that uh, she expects uh, that the new mechanism will be operational uh, within a month. I think she said six months, uh, Commissioner, if I'm correct. Uh, so I think the Commission very rightly stated, I think, a very feasible guideline. And for me, that's uh, something that uh, the parliament looks at with great optimism and but also this very resolution also stated that if the courts keep on dragging this procedure uh, for longer than expected then the parliament will ask for an expedited procedure so this is also another part of uh, of this process we expect of course everything to be done within the frameworks of rule of law 
fully legally, but without procrastination and very effectively. So uh, I do hope that the commission will act based upon what they told us. And uh, if it happens, then the parliament is very, very happy to work together in any issue we can. Uh, thank you very much to our two speakers for fully engaging uh, uh, with my questions, which were not always easy, but uh, I had so many more questions. Commissioner Reinders, final word, perhaps? No, not final word, because the final words all the time for the parliament, but uh, 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 no, just to, to add two, two very short elements. The first one, you need to make the difference between the work done in the commission and we have start the work, and then the presentation of a complete uh, uh, file to the council, of course, to, to start a real procedure, but you know that it's impossible to start from one day to the other. So we are at work and we will see when it will be possible to, to go to the council after the different uh, uh, discussions that we have on the guidelines and maybe uh, a ruling from the Court of Justice. And I know that you are very uh, interested by the possible ruling of the Court of Justice in such a case. The second element, because we have discussed a lot about uh, some member states, I want just to insist on the fact that there is an evolution in the mood about the rule of law in the European Union. I have seen that with the report on the rule of law. I just want to, to say that since the publication of the report, the first report in September, we have received many proposals for reforms in many member states. Of course, I'm not naive. We will verify if it's true. But you have seen maybe since, just to say that, since the beginning of last year, many reforms in Malta about the justice system and the uh, electoral process for the presidential elections, to give an example. You have seen maybe a real program in Bulgaria on the basis of our report, and I don't want to mention many others. So if it's true, if it's possible to see year after year with the publication on an annual rule of law report that there are some moves in different member states to improve the situation on the rule of law, it will be also a pressure for the countries or the member states where we, are, where we have a more systemic uh, situation. Just to say that, it's not to give a positive note, but also to say that we are not just working on one or two member states. We try to work with the 27, and I'm very uh, proud to see that with the first annual report, we have received a lot of uh, good proposals for reforms. Of course, again, I'm not naive, and we will verify that it's a reality and uh, it will be possible to see such a kind of reform entry into force. Thank you very much, uh, both for your time and your stimulating presentations and uh, fully engaging answers. Laszlo, a final word? I just would like to repeat what you just said. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming, uh, sharing uh, uh, with us uh, your ideas. Uh, I think, uh, uh, at least I can say that in my own name, uh, we have learned a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, we will uh, uh, come back to these uh, questions uh, uh, later, uh, let's say in one year from now. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.